Uh, welcome to DevOps Days Baltimore. This is my first DevOps Days Baltimore, but not my first DevOps Days. I uh, always joke that, that Nathan Harvey and I only, we both live in Maryland, um, right outside of Baltimore, and we only ever meet in other countries at DevOps Days, um, which is almost always true. This is like one of the first times that, that, that we've collided in our home states. Um, so. Uh, when, when I originally uh, was on the program, I was on program for an hour-long slot. So you can hopefully empathize with the challenges of delivering this in 30 minutes. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about reanimating DevOps. Um, and I, I, have, I have a lot of harsh words just to wake you up in the morning, right? So uh, uh, I'll try to keep my potty mouth um, in control, but that's not going to happen. But um, so. So the most interesting thing to me that's happened in DevOps is actually CI/CD, right? So when we look at Dev, first a survey: How many people here were in the industry, computing industry in general, before DevOps became popular? Okay, that's a great number. Um, uh, and how many people uh, came from a software development, software engineering, software development lifecycle side? And how many came from an operations side? Oh wow. It's like we can have some sort of pit fight later. It's going to be great. Um, so when I, I, I have some controversial uh, state, I, I was around when DevOps was coined um, and uh, participated in the DevOps community uh, a little more passively than actively uh, since then. Uh, and I have a very specific view of, of how this thing played out and how I wish it had played out instead. Um, so when I think of DevOps, it was really putting dev into ops. What I saw it as, it was uh, a somewhat condescending view from software engineers coming in and saying these poor operations people, man, their life is so tough, they don't understand how to automate anything, everything they do is just this rote, repetitive crap. I'm going to take my software magic and put it into your operations. And the two things that I would say that came out of that that were really fantastic were CI and CD. So the idea of automating the software engineering, um, and the software development, software release, release engineering, release management, and even deployment, which overlap a lot with ops. So it was really, really amazing. So it was a way for organizations to really move faster, and it required a tremendous amount of collaboration between development and operations to do this. Um, so this talk is about reanimating DevOps. Um, from, a, from a corpse. And carcass may be a, uh, a bit harsh, um, but then again, it may not be uh, that harsh. Um, so, so what does it, it, it look like, right? So the, the, the reason that CI and CD became so important is because, has anybody ever launched uh, like deployed software before? Okay. Um, Keep your hands up if it worked. <laughs> right. So we keep deploying the software, and the software is junk. And uh, so the interesting part of all of this is that what really happened was that uh, I'm going to make sure this is the right slide. This is the great. OK, so the one on the left. All right. So um, software engineers really had this idea that, that operations people struggled so much trying to deploy software. And, and the, the, the fact that they couldn't automate things, um, they, you know, they really needed help. And operations people were just like, can you just please not give me shit software? That's all I'm asking for is just don't give me stuff that doesn't work. Right? So the, um, the empathizing with the target of this, this effort didn't work very well. Right? So software engineers identified problems that operations people had, but it wasn't their primary problem. So, what do operations people need? So what I want to leave you with is the part of DevOps that never really came to fruition out of that. We have put a lot of software engineering practices into operations. What we didn't do is put a lot of the operations, blood, sweat, and tears, and operational practices and techniques into software engineering. And that was really what's missing. So operations desperately thrives on observability, right? When you deploy something, you have to be able to ask yourself, is it working? And if you can't answer that question, you have serious, serious problems. The first thing that we do is always nothing. 
right? How many people here have launched software and have no idea if it's working, right? Hopefully less today than 10 years ago, but 10 years ago, it was standard practice where it's like the box is on, I can ping it, and the process is running. My job is done as operations. And the reason it was done was because you had no porthole into that software to understand whether or not it was working or not. So then what do more sophisticated software engineers do? Um, they give you logs, right? So then you're, you're, you're paying Splunk a lot of money, um, but you're, you're looking at logs, you're, you're doing some sort of red light, green light monitoring to make sure that the system is working correctly. But it's still, systems, uh, just because they're up and on doesn't mean that they're, they're actually servicing their, their users well. Right, so then the third phase of that is really metrics analysis. Right, it's, it's taking measurements out of the software that are an indicator. It's a surrogate indicator to tell you that things are actually working the way they're supposed to be working. Turns out that's still not quite enough. Um, because when those metrics go wrong and you know this isn't working right, you're left with you know, all the pieces, uh, but you don't understand why. So that last step is really understanding what the behavior of the software is, right? And how many people here have deployed a piece of software, had it break, and no matter what question you wanted to ask of the software, it said, here's the answer. Like, why is this slow? What are you doing? Why did that database command, why, why did that database operation fail? You know, why did the service crash? What is the stack trace? Like, those are the types of things that the software should tell an operator, right? It shouldn't be some sort of magical thing that they have to divine. So a, a, a really s a quick uh, kind of detour is that we actually really solved this problem on a single system uh, about 12 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, with Dtrace. Um, does anybody here know what Dtrace is? Couple people. Um, how many people here run Linux? Uh, okay, how many people run Windows? Okay, those are the two platforms that don't do Dtrace. Um, every other platform in the world pretty much does it, from QNX to FreeBSD to Mac OS X to, to, to anything. Um, it was originally developed out of Sun Microsystems on the Solaris platform and Solaris 10. Uh, but what it is, it was a frustration of software engineers when they were in production and they wrote this beautiful piece of software, which of course didn't work. Um, and they deployed it, and it didn't work right. And the customer was saying, this is slow. And then you get in, you get in on the production system, um, and then you say, why is it slow? And they didn't have the tools to answer that question. So I don't know how many software engineers have told you when you're operating something, you're like, this doesn't work right. And they're like, well, can you, put, can you repeat it in development? It's like, no. No, the problem is here. Go fix the problem. Um, so the idea of being able to interrogate a production system when it isn't working is the holy grail, right? I don't want to have to f repeat the problem in a development environment because one, I may not repeat the, the same problem. I may struggle to repeat the problem. Um, and at the end of the day, that one production problem that I can observe is the real problem. So Dtrace um, actually solved kind of all of that. It allowed you to... Um, uh, instrument basically anything in the system. Uh, system calls, HBA adapters, everything from the hardware performance counters all the way up to lines of Ruby code and stack traces, all in one simple language that looked a little bit like awk, where you say, when I reach out over this TCP socket and I write some data that looks like this, give me a stack trace and tell me how much memory I just recently allocated. You know, like weird questions that one would say, why would you ever ask that question? And an operations person says, don't judge me, right? You're in, you have a problem. You need answers to your questions, right? So uh, recently, uh, eBPF came out in, in Linux, and we actually have uh, a bright future now. So eBPF is, is plumbing inside of the Linux kernel um, that really allows for building tools like Dtrace. So it is pretty exciting times. We are in the beginning of those times. So um, really quick, um, a, a, a story about web monitoring. Does anybody here run a website? Yeah? Or use the web? You know? Okay, cool. You're not all like an app nation. Um, so, has uh, anybody used like Google Analytics or some other tool like that, right? Okay, so 
rewind to 1997, 1998. Um, did anybody actually run a website in 1998? Well, they only, like, like three hands, four hands. Okay, all right, we're old. Um, so I'm going to give you this insight. It's going to make you just blood drain out of your face. How did you know that your site was up in 1998? Right? Well, one, 95% of people didn't know, didn't know they had to care. But the other 5%, we ended up paying inordinate sums of money to companies like Gomez and Keynote to ping your site every 15 minutes to make sure it was working. And when it came back with a green report, right, you can do the math on that, it's four times 24 times per day, you were like, 100% uptime, I'm perfect, this is great, and you're all laughing, right, you should be laughing, right? Checking your site is working every 15 minutes should give you about zero confidence that it is available, accessible, and performing. That is the dumbest thing that we can do with today's technology. So what do we do instead, right? We embed analytics into the web page, and every single person that actually visit the, visits the site ends up reporting things to you like performance data and availability data. So you actually know, you know, obviously don't know who didn't show up, right? If someone tries to access the site and it completely doesn't work, they don't report, they report nothing, right? And that's a little hard to track, which is why we still ping our sites every five minutes, usually every one minute. Um, but most of the data that we have about the performance and the availability of the system comes from this real user monitoring, right? So real user monitoring for the web is obvious. Now I'm going to paint a picture of today, which is how many people here run infrastructure at all, like any systems, like a Linux box or Windows box, or you know, if you're happy and have DTrace with a FreeBSD box. Um, how many people like ping it every 10 seconds or minute to ask it questions like, is your disk full or are you on, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it seems kind of interestingly dumb like the other system that we did 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? The idea is that you know that computer's actually doing stuff. That's its whole point, right? It's actually running software, it's servicing users, it's making TCP connections, sending packets, all that stuff. Every one of those things you could potentially measure to see how it's doing. Right, that is the future of what this is going. So when we're talking about data explosion, instead of pinging a box every, we used to ping them every five minutes, then we ping them every one minute. Now some people say, well, I ping it every 10 seconds. You know, that's fast enough. It's like, okay, do you realize with like 72 cores in a box running at, at you know, 2.6 gigahertz, the computer actually does a lot in 10 seconds. Like a lot, a lot, a lot, right? Billions and billions of things in 10 seconds. And any one of those can have an aberrant latency that can cause problems for users. Um, it, can, it can go off the rails. Um, so so you're actually observing the entire stack of that and all of the behavior that happens on the system is going to happen. So the problem is, is that is an information scale problem. Right? When we look at, at um, Moore's law, um, that is that technology tends to double every 18 months. So if you do that math out from 2000 to 2017, that's a 2,500-fold increase, 2,500 times um, the, the size of, of data ingest. So we're starting to look at um, things like an exabyte a day coming in to architectures, if you start doing all of that. And people are like, what? Like exabyte, that's insane. No one's going to do an exabyte a day. So I'll rewind. 20 years and say, we have a terabyte of RAM in boxes. And if you told that to somebody 20 years ago, they'd be like, yeah, that, that will never happen, ever. Like, that's crazy. There's like one box in the world that needs that. Who cares? Everyone else will scale out. Like, we have racks and racks of boxes with one terabyte of memory, right? So this, this is coming. So 15, 20 years from now, the idea of people tossing around their dollar a month exabyte cloud uh, storage is totally going to happen. Right? And the data that you're going to put in there um, is not necessarily information overload, but you definitely have to have tooling around making sense of it all. These are the problems that are coming, is what do you do with that? So kind of back to systems that are broken. So there are two methods for dealing with systems that are broken. One is because in this previous slide, uh, backwards. 
We don't have an exabyte of data. We cannot write this. If I observed every single thing that happened on any of my systems, I would explode my information space. I'd never be able to store it. I can't really make sense of it. So I can't store it all. So there's two things that I can do. I can either store it all in aggregate, throw away critically uh, important details about that, or I can sample that. And anybody who tells you that one of those is right is completely wrong. They're both right. They're two entirely separate approaches. One of them is that you sample data, so every 100,000th transaction or every transaction that has like a known anomaly, you end up tracing really, really detailed information about it, everything you can think about that piece of, uh, that, of that transaction, and you keep that. And that's really useful for understanding the, the, the nature of transactions in the system and debugging problems. Um, but then there are 100,000 other things that happened in that system that you, you don't know about. And what you want to do is you want to store everything, but you can't. So what you do is you end up storing behavioral data about that. It's like how long those operations tend to take, and you, and you aggregate that data. So um, where, where does that go? Uh, on the tracing side, you have technologies like eBPF and T-Trace, um, event-driven stuff. Uh, there's a lot of the stuff from like Honeycomb um, uh, is starting to look at that. Um, uh, that. The product is really cool. Uh, I don't really understand the marketing there. Uh, because they're highlighting the top one as if it's the only one that matters. The top one is super important, and, and those sorts of tools are really, really interesting and help you debug systems, help you ask what is going on. Um, but without generalized behavior information, you're really left with only one side of the story. So we need that generalized behavior stuff. Um, that's what we do at our company. We, we, we track data. So um, I want to dive into things that you can take back to the software engineering organization that can make their software run better in production. Right? That's our entire goal is not just to ship shit fast, it's to ship software fast. I really don't want those two things to be synonymous. Right? So how do you make your software better? Um, and the first and most important thing that we can learn, and this is much more important now that we have distributed systems everywhere. Um, I, I studied at Johns Hopkins. I was in the Center for Networking and Distributed Systems there. I ended up leaving SANS a PhD after spending way too many years there. Uh, if you get me drunk enough, I'll tell you the story. Um, I left and said, I will never debug distributed systems again. And here we are. So that sucked. That did not work out how I planned. Um, but the one most important thing you can do in building a system, in particular a distributed system, is understanding how to fail with grace. Right? You need to fail quickly and safely. Um, and I would say that the airline industry is a great example of anecdotal stories around this. You have engines fall off of planes and they still land and people, people survive, right? So the idea of like when things go wrong, you don't want to just keep trying, right? The engine falls off the plane, it's like, eh, we might make it. You know, that's not how you do it. You say, this is the procedure, we're gonna shut this down, we're gonna turn it off as quickly as possible. Um, and then the way that that happens in distributed systems is much more complicated because all of the adjoining systems need to accommodate that, right? So when people say new software is really designed for failure, uh, that is a layered cake of truths and pains. Um, so any part of your system can fail at any time and, and being able to react to those different components in their, in their states of uh, uncooperative nature um, is really important. So there are a lot of techniques in doing this. I'm not going to dive into those. Not enough time. The second rule is that autop autopsies are not just for medicine. Okay, the days of old IT when the computer froze up and the mouse didn't work and the IT person came in and said, well, if you just restart it, everything will be fine, is not an answer. Okay, these things, when you do 100,000 transactions through them, you're going to have them again and again and again, and you're going to screw more and more users. Um, as your system grows, it is not acceptable to have a failure in your architecture, especially one that repeats, that you cannot explain. You have to get to the bottom of the problems. Um, computers are so much better. This is not how I want to say that. This is being recorded. S computers are so much easier than children. Um, <laughs> right? So I go to work and I tell a computer what to do, and it pretty much always follows my directions. You know, aside from a couple of microcode bugs, but even then they're following someone else's directions. There tend to be very few um, scenarios in which a computer is actually 
um, malfunction in a non malfunctions in a non-deterministic way. My children are entirely non-deterministic. Um, so there isn't, because this, the system always follows your instructions, it means when it screws up, it did what it was told, it's very likely it's going to do the same thing again. Um, so the days of did you turn it off and on again really need to end, and even more so in large-scale deployed distributed systems. Another one which, if you've been to any software engineering conference, you've probably heard, uh, is using a technique of circuit breakers. And this is about failing gracefully. So there is a very, very big difference between being electrocuted um, and being shocked. Right? So when something is about to fail, trying harder is usually not the right answer. You actually want to have the circuit breaker flip. So you really need to design tolerances in your systems so that when a component or an interaction in that system uh, it starts to go wrong or goes too slow, um, then, then it doesn't just keep piling on more work. Um, so our traffic systems, everybody love the traffic right here. Anybody come from DC? Yeah, there you go. Enjoy going home. Um, so that is a great example of a system unlike uh, out, out west. Uh, you know, on, on the on-ramps out west, they have the red light, green light um, indicators to flow control traffic into the, into the highways. Um, I, I have know of like one road around here that does that, but I, the, the beltway certainly doesn't do that. And what happens is you get three and a half hour backups because when the road slows down, there is no way for the underlying system to stop putting traffic into the problem. Right? It just adds more traffic to the problem. Um, and this doesn't work well. It, it really, really doesn't work well. Um, if you look at some research about uh, self-driving cars, um, they tend to go a little bit slower, and they leave more cushion between cars, and they tend to not have traffic jams because of that, because there's no jerks. They're all driving the same way. So by, uh, by uh, putting circuit breakers into the system, you actually can control the behavior of the system better. Right? It's much better to have 50% you know, of your traffic turned away and 50% of it served well than 100% of it served poorly. Right? And uh, if you serve all your traffic poorly, when I say poorly, it means that your, your web page doesn't load, the images don't all load, you can't check out. Like It's great to go and shop, and then you can't pay. Right? Like, what do you do? Anybody know what you do? You go to Amazon. They don't have that problem. Right, so now you've lost business, Amazon's got more business. There's a reason that, uh, that, that Amazon designs the systems the way they do. Um, and has anybody ever had a service failure in Amazon? Yeah, has ever anybody had a really frustratingly long load experience with Amazon where you thought it might work but you just couldn't get it to work? Because I have never had one of those. When I go to Amazon it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's like, we're, al we're overloaded, sorry, that's it. Right? And the reason is, is because they are gating traffic in. They only want to let enough customers in where they know they can deliver that service. If they let too many in, it degrades service for everyone um, to the point where they abandon. So uh, rule four is that you cannot, under you cannot understand uh, what you cannot measure. All right? So. So many times in, in software, uh, you know, there's data structures and algorithms and, and searches that are running. Everything that you do has a performance. Uh, if you launch an API service, people are hitting that API. It takes a certain number of microseconds to service that call. I don't know how many times I've gone into an organization and said, how long does it take for that API to call to run? It's like, meh, that's pretty fast. Like, what, what does that mean? What, what? That's, not a, that's not a speed. Fast is not a speed. This is not the Ricky Bobby of, uh, of API services, right? So you really need to measure everything. And error on the, uh, even if you don't store it all, error on the, on the side of exposing everything you can in a piece of software, right? The software should be instrumented so that someone can ask a question later. Um, so understand everything, and you can do that through measuring it. And in a lot of cases, and this is for your job's sake, um, the best way to not get to do an awesome job and not get a promotion or get a bonus or anything is to go improve the system and not be able to describe how well you improved it. Like, I made it faster. Oh, I want to go fast. That's great. Um, no, but if you can come in and say, I dropped, you know, user user service experience from from you know 700 milliseconds down to 250 milliseconds, 
Um, and hey, look, there's this Shopify report from like eight years ago that says that's awesome for these reasons. Um, look, our revenues went up, our shopping carts went through, our, you know, our users are happier. If you are measuring those, you can see the impact of your work and your colleagues' work. And there is nothing worse than being able to, well, there is something worse than being successful and not being able to show it. That's being horribly unsuccessful and being fired. Um, but it's very frustrating nonetheless. So um, you measure to understand. Um, and one of the reasons that we measure, and it's a predicate to this, is that um, a lot of times in operations, this is one of the reasons that I railed against uh, operational culture for a very long time, is that in operations, people just expect you to keep the website up. Right? And with a phrasing like that, if it's not up, it's down. That's 100%. That's perfection. Right? The idea of aiming at 100% uptime and 100% service quality is the dumbest thing that any organization can do because you can never exceed expectations. Right? And, and you should never set up your environment that way. Right? The, the, the culture in the company needs to measure things, and they need to use that to build in what we call failure budgets. Right? You need to have a budget for failure. You need to say that maybe I, my site only needs to be up 99.9% .9 of the time. Right? That's actually a pretty loose constraint. Right? My site's down all the time because Amazon's only up 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, but if my site is up 99.99% of the time going into the end of the month, I can go down. Why would I not go down? Still meet all my, my constraints, right? Why don't I take those risks? Why don't I launch those features that were marked slightly unstable and test them out in production where I can get faster feedback, more valuably, and still be able to deliver on my, my quality of service requirements and my, my service level agreements? So by measuring everything and defining what your uptime is and what your performance is, it means that when you do better than that and you are st more stable than that, you can introduce the risk that allows us to all go faster, right? So DevOps in general is around moving organizations faster. That's not actually true. It's about de-risking the speed. And this failure budget methodology allows you to de-risk speed. So, and my last one is that while justice should be blind, operations should be not blind at all. It's, it's, a, it's a sad thing. I love this picture. It's my favorite. Don't show it to little kids, though. It's kind of freaky. The Kermit the Frog in the, in the hand. What did they do to him? Um, so, when you are in production, the only failure that matters is the one that you're experiencing right now. So it's absolutely critical that everything that you do in developing software and all the practices that you apply in operating that software can lead you to diagnosing that failure in reality, like as it is in production. Repeating failures is both uh, a highly error-prone and very elusive. I've seen software uh, uh, architectures where you have a bug report from a, a customer and an engineering group of three or four people spend three weeks trying to reproduce the error in development so that they can fix it, right? Go into production and just figure it out. And if you wreck a train car in there, you're allowed to in your environment if you have an error budget, right? So you can actually go and look at these things live. Um, I, I, I do say that, that um, uh, GDPR and other things like that uh, make it a little bit more difficult um, because as you go into production, you as an as a engineer are exposed to information that you may not be uh, allowed to be exposed to, so this complicates things. Um, but there are ways to do that using canary systems, so you have production environments that don't take normal production traffic, right? But it is in production, it uses all the production systems, and when you have a problem, it's a lot easier to, to, to divert a problematic user to that canary system or infrastructure than it is to repeat the entire problem in a development environment. So there are methodologies and techniques that we can use when deploying production systems that give us access, easy access, to um, isolating existing production problems so that we can solve them. Um, and that is, that is it. So if you do those things, uh, you will be much happier people because your shit won't be broken all the time. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.